Welcome to the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the podcast where Ian McCormack and I delve into the heart of the most significant municipal news spanning Canada from coast to coast to coast. Each episode, we unravel the intricacies, dissect the decisions, and explore the dynamic landscape of local governance. We are continuing our journey through the municipal alphabet today, and we today we are bringing you the letter T, which stands for triage. Later in the episode, Ian and I will be joined by Cheryl Spencer Morley, a communications and crisis management expert in the province of Alberta. But first, we are back for our last full episode of 2023. Ian, how has it been? How is that even possible, Chris? It's been it's been good. I've been at home for the last, or at least not left the province for the last few weeks. So that's kind of a new and novel concept. That's kind of nice. We have a packed full episode. So let's get into the stories yep, here. Let's go. Surrey, British Columbia Mayor Brenda Lockie isn't alone anymore. Other local government leaders are expressing frustrations with the NDP government taking away some of their local powers. Earlier this month, Mayor Lockie said lawyers hired by the city would argue in court that the unconstitutionality for Solicitor General Mike Farnsworth to override the will of the 2022 elected city council and accelerate the switch from the RCMP to the Surrey Police Service by replacing the police board with a single administrator. Two Vancouver Island mayors spoke out earlier this month against Housing Supply Act amendments that diminished municipal control and public consultations over land use decisions. Oak Bay Mayor Kevin Murdoch had even more to say in a 12-minute video in defense of local government. He said that Premier David Eby's government is sacrificing democracy in favor of efficiency by ending public hearings if a zoning application corresponds with the official community plan. Relationships between the province and municipalities are coming to a loggerhead, Ian. How do municipalities navigate the demands of the province with the challenges of their community? Well, first of all, I'd like to say, Chris, that this isn't a tale of like some small town that's going sideways due to a lack of sophistication. I looked it up and Surrey has over half a million people in it. So this is something that is certainly a conscious choice. And the two others you referenced who have joined in, so Oak Bay and uh, and Souk are part of the Capital Region District on Vancouver Island. So again, uh, similar, not similar sized, but certainly well, good sized municipalities as well. Which also leads me to think, uh, how long will it be like until associations like the Union of BC Municipalities start to weigh in as well? And... A lot of the detractors here, or not the commenters anyway, are saying that a lot of the issues that are happening here, whether it's Ontario giving away or giving out strong mayor powers or the government of BC pulling them back, uh, comes from the fact the Constitution says that the uh, the local governments can are creatures of the provinces and so they can change from place to place. And the other reference that actually was in this article too, was saying that the Constitution Act going back to 1867 is pretty darn old. However, those powers are enshrined in it, and it's kind of like opening Pandora's box if anybody is interested in any making any changes, because nobody's going to open the Constitution just to say that uh, local government is an order of government within Canada of its own in its own rights and responsibilities, too. So to me, there's something quite significant there. Now, this one particularly, I read a reference early that this is kind of like the tale of two cities, if you like. If you were to compare Surrey with Toronto and say that one's getting strong mayor powers and one is having powers pulled back by the province, that shows how differently there is a perspective. Now, I don't know how different it would be that because um, BC, of course, has an NDP provincial government, Ontario has a conservative provincial government, and whether philosophy plays into that as well. This is also something that I could see um, as a, a devolution or downloading of responsibility without downloading of authority, or in this case, re-uploading both responsibility and authority and trying to make somebody else look bad. That this is perhaps a case of gotcha or perhaps a case of having another order of government take the fall. Now, I suspect that's not all of it, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was part of it as well. 
I, I want to talk about the two communities on Vancouver Island for a second here, because I, I, I want to talk about the housing crisis, because yeah. I'm hearing this a lot from across municipal leaders from across Canada, that housing is a major priority. We <laughs> hear we hear all the time from provincial premiers that housing is a priority for them. Is this just them doing what they're supposed to do to ensure that housing gets built? We see it happening in Ontario, like you said, with the strong mayor powers. We're seeing it in BC with them saying, we're just going to rough, run roughshod. You you so eloquently said it. The municipalities are kind of the children of the province. So do municipalities have a leg to stand on here when they're sort of yelling into the media landscape to say we don't like what's going on, but the provinces have at the end of the day ultimate control over what a municipality can and can't do, and the funding of it too to a greater <laughs> extent, right? So they they control the purse strings, so they control some of the desired outcomes as well. There's reference to things like official community plans, which are known as official plans or municipal development plans elsewhere, uh, talking about we've essentially set out the zoning of the city about what can happen next to something else. So why bother uh, with going through the efficiency argument was why bother going through a public hearing process for something that's kind of already set out in the official plan? Now, has the government of proximity, the local government has the best feel for what's going on from place to place? The, I mean, a lot of the, the capital cost for anything to do with housing at the moment, the new capital anyway, I think is actually coming from the federal government rather than the various provincial governments, which sets up another fight about should the provinces, sorry, should the federal government be dealing directly with the municipalities and cutting the provinces and territories out and that that is certainly not being received particularly well either. There, you're correct, I mean, obviously, about the shortage of housing uh, not well specifically avail uh, attainable or affordable housing across the country but certainly in some of the major urban centers where it's really expensive too so expedience and expediency in this case is uh, do we just go ahead and and build the housing or get the developers to build the housing in places and essentially cut through the what they call red tape of the municipalities but in reality sometimes that's municipalities doing their due diligence about what ought to be situated next to what so i don't think this is something that looks particularly good on any order of government particularly the provinces Wasagas Beach in Ontario, CAO dropped a political bombshell in council in November with allegations the previous administration engaged in questionable behavior. The town CAO, Andrew McNeil, alleged that the previous administration destroyed or erased hundreds of thousands of town records and documents in the days following the election last October. Quote, what were the officers of the corporation and more specifically the CAO trying to hide? McNeil said, quote, this went well beyond standard policies and procedures. It's actually not allowed to do what was done here. So, yes, I do believe there was something that was attempted to be covered up, end quote. The alleged document's destruction is said to be connected to the previous council's dealings concerning the business park, beachfront development and arena and library real estate dating back to 2018. The town says it believes the previous council was misled regarding negotiations, appraisals, and the value of town lands being sold to developers. It should be noted in the 2022 municipal election, all but one municipal councillor was from the previous term was defeated. Ian, I wanted to talk about this issue with you because, and I should clarify that we're only hearing one side of the story from this news article that is linked in the show notes. We do not know what the former CAO has said because he has not said anything publicly so far. So Ian, I've got to ask the question because the town has said we they might not have been aware. How can councils ensure that their municipalities are hearing the full stories when reports are presented in front of them. Yeah, wow, well, this is just a bizarre story all around, uh, Chris. The vast majority of municipal managers in this country are beyond reproach and loved by their councils, or at least respected by their councils. In this case, however, the, the, the matter of trust has come up, but so has the matter of transparency as well. And both of them are being called into question. The interesting thing to me in this one is the comment that council was kind of cut out of the loop of it as well. So council was acting on the best inform the information that they had at hand, which they believed was being provided was honest, truthful, fulsome, all the rest of those sorts of things. 
but in reality may not have been. So they were making decisions to the benefit of some somebody, some organization, some entity on what essentially is incomplete or um, inaccurate information. So there certainly is a piece here that, I mean, councils are not typically 24 seven municipal governors. They're relying on the checks and balances that are in their organization. They of course only have the single employee in their manager or their CAO. So they have to trust in that person. The checks and balances from behind that, of course, are staff and managers and whatnot. And the story uh, indicates that some of those people had concerns as well. So there is uh, some indication that this, what's called an allegations of a cover-up, was kind of known within the last few years, maybe the last council as well, but never really burbled to the surface. And there was nothing in that story that indicated that council really was aware of anything until very recently. And I'll say too that this, the referral to the legal system that has been made uh, as part of this means that it's out of the municipality's hands now. So it goes into the legal system and the legal system will do some sort of an investigation into what actually happened, which version of the truth is the real one. How important is it for a council, and I say council more as the mayor, the mayor and the CAO to have a working respectful relationship because um we 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 sat down with a former CAO and a CAO for C is for CAO earlier on in this series and they talked about that working relationship how important is it for them to have that working relationship well and sort of entrenched so something like this doesn't happen in a community of any size or any location in Canada well, I won't speak to this one specifically, but if there is a person, whether it's a CAO or anybody else who has criminal intent, there's probably not a lot that somebody who is acting in good faith can do about it unless their spidey senses start to tingle. You had talked about the open communication. The CAO and the mayor or Reeve or warden or whatever don't have to be friends, but they do have to have mutual respect in order for that to happen, for the, the relationship to actually work. There's many a municipality in this country who during an election period, you hear lots of candidates saying, we got to get rid of the old oh, the old people there on the take. Uh, we need change, any of those sorts of things, which of course is now driving up the costs of CAOs across the country as well. So some of this, a lot of this I think is cultural. Some of it is on the CAOs. Some of it is on the council as well, but that relationship needs to matter. And some of the, there ought to be some rules laid out because a mayor is a single member of council like anybody else. And so any relationship that they have with the CAO ought to contain information which the rest of council also knows about. It's just inconvenient or to have a seven-on-one meeting rather than a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So in this case, they, the rest of council has to rely on the mayor. Their mayor has to rely on the, the, the integrity of the CAO as well. So the, the, the relationship is critical. The town of Faro, Yukon, wants to conduct a census that accounts for its transient workers. Mayor Jack Bowers believes the headcount will help ensure the town receives territorial funding that reflects an accurate num number of people who rely on municipal services. Quote, we've always believed that our numbers have been somewhat underreported, Bowers said. So the census is really needed to give some legitimacy to what the real number would be. According to its first quarter population report, the Yukon Borough of Statistics listed Faro's population at 467, but Bauer estimates that that is more than 500 people in the town, saying the YBS numbers do not include numerous visiting construction crews. He also expects hundreds will arrive in the area for the mine project that is going to be going on. Ian. This is a good story to talk about as municipalities are looking for more infrastructure funding from provinces, from territorial governments, and even yeah. the federal government. And for some provinces, funding corresponds to population like it does in Yukon. Does the mayor have a leg to stand on when asking for a new census or for the government to accept the census numbers that the community reports on? I don't know that the mayor actually has a legal leg to stand on, but he certainly, I think anyway, has a strong case to make. And uh, the, I mean, there's very few sources of income for local government in Canada, even if you're in the North. I mean, a lot of the Southern places rely on things like property taxes. That's not always the case North of 60. So government transfers, whether from the Yukon or from the federal government, probably comprise a significant portion 
of the town of Faro's uh, annual operating and capital budget. So it's not just infrastructure, it might be social funding, uh, program funding as well. So these per capita grants become really important. However, um, maybe not even a however here. So if you have 400 people driving on the streets versus 500, or 400, uh, 500 people who are accessing recreational programs and services versus 400, that makes a significant change. So these people who are uh, itinerant or transient, sometimes belonging to work camps, which are, are outside an incorporated area, um, having an impact on the programs and services of the incorporated area, certainly for the sake of the use of facilities and infrastructure and programs, there are 500 people rather than 400 using them. So this, however, could result in people being counted twice. They could be, Faro, if it gets its way, would be provided funding for these transient workers. Chances are their home municipality, wherever that is, is also including them in census statistics as well. So they essentially the same person counts for two, two people in terms of granting. So this, I think, will be, I mean, it's more of an impact for people who may be coming in from outside Yukon to be transient workers, work camp people versus those who are coming from inside Yukon, because essentially it's the same person. When they come from outside, of course, another province or territory is paying part of the freight as well. So I think that does have an impact. I think the mayor has a good philosophical case, but legally, the way the grants are written, I'm not sure there's a whole lot that can be done about it other than advocacy to try and change those rules in the first place. One of the things I was thinking about when I was reading this story is when I, you, when you take larger urban centers, let's say Edmonton, for example, not everyone who is in Edmonton lives in Edmonton. There are people in Sherwood Park. There's people in Strathcona who drive into Edmonton to work. So would they be considered potentially a population because they're using the services, they're using the roads, they're using the water? So would they be uh, expected to give more money to the larger urban centers because of this? So it does pose a challenge for provincial and territorial governments. But I, like you said, I can see where the mayor is sort of looking at because mm -hmm. a lot of people are using services and for transients, they come, they stay there for eight to 10 months and then they leave and mm -hmm. they may not be there for every weekend, but it is a story that needs to be talked about. And hopefully the mayor gets the resolution he's looking for with I, even a little bit of extra funding. There's one more comment on this, and that is if the transient workers are staying literally in town, staying in restaurants, stay, sorry, staying in hotels, eating at restaurants, buying gas, Doritos and any of those sort of things, then there is a bit of a circular economy going on. Sometimes uh, there are other places where a municipal, sorry, an urban area is not doesn't have the people living in it. They're living in a work camp, say, in the surrounding rural area. So they're not availing themselves of hotels and restaurants and gas stations necessarily. So to me, those two count as a, in a slightly different fashion. It's true. We'll be right back after this quick break with Cheryl Spencer Morley, a communications and crisis management expert in the province of Alberta. We'll be right back. Welcome to Tea is for Triage on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Cheryl Spencer Morley. Cheryl brings a wealth of crisis management and knowledge to her position. Throughout her 25 years of public sector experience at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels, her strategic communications approaches have always revolved around providing proactive, authentic, and transparent communication. Now, she is no stranger to municipal issues and crisis management. For the last 10 years, her municipal senior leadership experience has included serving communities small and large in such roles as Director of Communications for Strathcona County, Director of Communications for the City of Edmonton, and Director of Communications for the former Mayor of Edmonton, Don Iverson, and the Chair of the Big City Mayor's Caucus. She has decades of experience in building and implementing crisis management plans, and she has served as an issues and crisis spokesperson for federal, provincial, municipal governments. Some of the sensitive issues and crises she has dealt with include budget cuts, homelessness, opioid crisis, affordable housing, transit, the environment, employees being charged, code of conduct violations, racism, controversial council decisions, floods, wildfires, pandemics, infrastructure project delays, children dying in foster care, shootings, and bomb threats. So with that extensive background, we are so pleased to welcome Cheryl to the show. Cheryl, welcome to the Political Trenches. Thanks for having me. 
So I'm going to start off the line of questioning with my first question, then we're going to throw it over to Ian. And my first question to you is, how can municipalities proactively identify potential crisis situations that may require effective, and I use the word effective there, crisis management and communications? Very important. It's so critical that people can be proactive in planning ahead. And with that in mind, I think even thinking about the most remote chance of something happening, better to be prepared than not. So I'm a big advocate of even if you don't think in your municipality that something might happen, like you have an active shooter situation or maybe no chance of flooding because you have such great infrastructure in place, you should always be prepared no matter what. So for me, I think it's about thinking about not to be glim, but you should think about every possible disaster that could happen and every issue and work with your communication staff to be able to prepare templates for everything so that you can be ready to go and not be caught off guard so that you can start responding right away. All right, well, I'll jump in then too. I'm gonna to take the flip side of that too and talk about in your experience, what sort of consequences have you seen for your the triage function, the communications function not working well, uh, either in the short term or the long term or, or both? Yeah, you bet. I think what happens sometimes is uh, people, I mean, pan the pandemic definitely put a higher emphasis on the need to prepare and that threw everybody off guard. So I have noticed an increase in interest in preparing more effectively for uh, these types of crises. But I think no matter what, um, people do not think something's going to happen and then it does and then nothing's prepared. So we know that social media is happening right away no matter what. You could be a parent that's out of school and you hear about something and you're posting it on social media before school can even respond. Or you're the student that's at the school. No matter what, community members are on social media and they are talking. So the longer it takes you to even acknowledge that an event is happening, you've already lost the opportunity to acknowledge that you're aware. And even if you don't have all of the information that you're able to acknowledge that you are aware that the search situation or you're trying to gather more information and that you'll be back in touch and tell people when you are. So I think when you don't, they feel like you're not being responsive and your reputation suffers as a result. And they don't necessarily expect you to have all of the answers, but they do want to know that somebody's on it because people get nervous whenever there's an issue or a crisis is happening. It's very natural for people to feel very nervous. And what do they do when they're nervous? They start to make up information or start to spread the rumor chain. And that's not healthy for anyone. So if we can stay on top of rumors as early as possible and say, these are the facts. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. And this is when we will know it. I think it really helps to keep people calm. Hmm. I'd like to circle back to just some things you had talked about before about how do you handle some of this triage function. You talked about confidence or portraying an air of confidence. How important is that confidence in a crisis, whether it's real confidence or whether it's performative conference, 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 confidence on behalf of any order of government or any organization you happen to be speaking for? Well, my experience has been is that the people can really smell when people are not telling the truth and people prefer authentic communications so I think if you're confident in what you're saying but you're being also as transparent and honest as possible that people will tell I mean mm -hmm. we've all been in the position where we've watched politicians uh, say things on tv or in social media and we all judge them we know it's a true fact we judge them based on hmm I believe them or I don't believe them but why is that is it because of your political views or is it because their answer doesn't sound authentic or is it because the people that they've surrounded themselves with with the facts don't feel like they're telling the truth people just really see it and that's why it's so important that in some of these scenarios matching some of that political with also some of the administrative side is really powerful at times. So that as an example, uh, the mayor of any municipality might deliver a message for the people and trying to at least acknowledge what's happening and be empathetic towards what's happening in the community. But the mayor shouldn't be expected to be the firefighter expert and the administrative expert with all the facts of things that are happening and get too overly involved. And this is a common issue that comes up in terms of which level of involvement mayor and council want to have versus 
uh, administration. So I think having the right people around you to have the right combination of authenticity from their perspective so that you can match both kind of the governance, but also uh, the administrative side and the facts side is key to being able to have the confidence level that people need. Now, you, you've been talking from the perspective of someone who's worked provincially uh, with a larger municipality and with the, the, the capital of Alberta. But there are probably people listening to this right now who don't come from a large municipal administration, who have one or two people in their office and they're not a director of communications. What advice would you give to the smaller communities, the smaller rural communities, or even smaller villages and towns who may not have the budgets to have a director of communications or someone like yourself on the staff to provide this service and provide crisis management during a potential crisis? I would say call Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take anyone's phone call and help walk them through the steps. No, but in, in all reality, that is a passion of mine is, is how do we help each other and how do municipalities help each other? So even for the smaller shops coming together as a, as a family of municipal communicators in Alberta has been really critical. And if anyone's listening from those municipalities, I mean, we, we host conferences and part of it is talking about through some of those challenges, like, Hey, it's just me. I am party of one. How do I have access to this? What do I do? Where do I get backup? And the answer is each other. At any time, we should be able to call on each other as colleagues across Alberta and say, how can I help you? How can I serve you? Because when it comes to managing crisis, it's, it's all of our reputation and we have the ability to help one another. So I think it's getting your help set up early. So even if you are the shop of one or two, okay, who else could you go to that's either nearby and can get to you quickly or who can you have on speed dial that you could call right away? And I know I was half joking when I said call Cheryl, but I really do mean it. If someone really needed to, it'd be just call because the, the critical moments when you're freaking out when it's first happening to you can be very overwhelming. And you wanna be able to be ready for that and know how to proceed from there and help set up a good plan. But I think knowing who can you count on around you, um, who might you call in and having those established relationships in advance will be very helpful because in the communications family, we all feel each other's pain and we want to help each other. So where we can, I know that anyone across Alberta would help another colleague out and across Canada as well. So speaking of things like, like building skill or knowing what the heck's going on, is there training or books or courses that individuals, members of council, or no, maybe not members of council, but members of administrations might be able to take to learn how to do some of this stuff? Well, the traditional method has been, of course, the incident command system training, uh, ICS for short is what they call it. What I find, and it's not to, to slight the system, but it's very much like it's based on a lot of like fire and police type situations and, and it's built in that in that command structure um, but the ICS training is very critical to take in every municipality to be able to know okay how will the governance work when it comes to decision making and the who's communicating what to whom and who's making those decisions and the planning in advance so that would be number one if you've never heard of ICS I would say go there first and make sure you take that and take as many levels as you possibly can because you will never regret taking them. I just think what's lacking right now across the country is what are some of the courses we could be collectively doing together in terms of, okay, actually going through real scenarios and doing some more training across Canada to help each other out and say, okay, well, what if this happened? And what if this happened? And there's, there's way less of those. I know, um, Ian and I have chatted about, geez, that would be something great to be able to, to put together for folks as well and being able to run uh, municipalities through it as well. And I think it's important to run the mayor and council, not just through the exercise of this is your governance role, but actually running them through an exercise of if this happened, what would you be saying on social media? And let's have you play the role of spokesperson and being able to do that. So no matter what, being able to do that. So I mean, like I said, I'm always happy to help. And if people reach out, there's always a way that you can do that training for municipalities to cater it. But I think it's critical that you just keep practicing at that local level. I'll, uh, I'll throw it into the mix politics, into the mix a little bit too. You've made several references to it. Have you ever run into a case where politics has come into play 
in how we, whatever organization responds to, to a crisis and kind of how do you deal with that, with that if it does happen? I think politics always comes into play because it's politics. So, <laughs> okay. um, you know, I'll use an example of when uh, Fort McMurray had to be evacuated and the city of Edmonton was a host reception center. I don't think anyone was totally prepared for something of that nature and what was going to happen in terms of all the levels of government suddenly getting involved politically. We had the you know, ministers, the prime minister, you've got the premier calling, and we're not even the municipality that was getting evacuated. We're just I mean, the host center for the people that had been evacuated and the pressures. So being able to put someone on the handle the political pressures is a pretty key role. So in that case, um, I played that role in terms of trying to at least communicate between anyone that was trying to contact from the different political levels and trying to keep them all with the same information. It's it's big things to juggle when it comes to everybody wants to say something about a crisis and they need that politically to be able to say what they're doing about it. But how do you balance that effectively? But politics, no matter what, it always comes into play. I haven't seen one major crisis that's happened, whether it's wildfire or the pandemic where politics has not been at play. But I think if you, again, going back to kind of that respecting each other's levels, um, but also where everyone's kind of coming from. Sometimes the federal government and the provincial government may not have the same understanding of the municipal pressures and have a particular plan in mind. And they need to be able to talk that through with the municipality to be able to find a way to make sure is that actually doable and what's actually going to be helpful because everyone ends up wanting to help and, and say something and do something. But sometimes we're not ready yet. And we just need to get through the initial phase before we can even tell them that. Gerald, uh, I want to thank, take a moment and thank you from both Ian and myself for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk to us about crisis communication and crisis management. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks, My Sean. pleasure. Our full interview with Cheryl will air next Wednesday. We'll be right back after this quick break. ENT is for triage. Done. Cheryl was an amazing guest, and I, I can't wait for everyone to listen to next week's full interview with her because it's going to be hard to try and cut down our full 35-minute interview with her into 15 minutes. So please tune in next Wednesday to check the full interview out. Yeah. Sorry, Cheryl. But yes, you're <laughs> absolutely right. There was a lot of really good questions in there. And I think very timely as well, some of the things that she had talked about, some of the long-term issues that we're facing, things like COVID or pandemics in general. Uh, some of the changes that she has seen systemically in local government and her profession as well, I think really count for something significant that we can learn from. So as we we talked about uh, two weeks ago uh, when this airs, uh, the city of Chestermere is, uh, well, the Minister of Municipal Affairs uh, finally got his will and uh, the court said, no, we're going to side with the Minister of Municipal Affairs and they're going to potentially be firing the entire council here soon. This is an ongoing drama, Ian. Uh, is this regular for a city to fight back this way? And would the city not just have to accept the court's ruling now? If you accept the rule of law, then yes. Uh, however, I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, he said, she said in this as well. So I suspect we've not seen the end of it, even if it comes to pass that the elected officials and the senior managers are let go. I, I don't think that's going to be the end of the story. So as I said at the beginning of the interview, at the beginning of the show, uh, this is our last full episode yeah. of 2023. But in two weeks time, Ian and I will be sitting down to chat about the biggest political news stories and recap some of the stories that we've talked about on the political trenches, of local government uh, at work for the last year. So the last 12 months, we've talked about some of the stories. So we're going to give some updates on that. But we kind of need your help for those who are listening and watching this right now. If you have a municipal story that you want us to talk about at the end of 2023, as it was the biggest news story for you of 2023 municipally, send it in to us. We have a link on the Cross Border Interviews website. We'll send it over to Strategic Steps so that way they can link it to us as well and submit your news story so we can dissect what you were watching, what you were reading this year, and sort of get some audience participation here going on because we always like to hear feedback from our listeners and our viewers so please submit your new stories of 2023 because we want to talk about them in two weeks right ian 
I'm looking forward to seeing what people come up with and seeing some of the submissions so far. Some of them are national. Some of them are local. All politics is local, ultimately. With that, we'll be back in two weeks' time. Until then, thanks so much for doing this again, Ian. Yeah, bye-bye. See you later.